I was going to dinner with a friend, and the restaurant we were going to go to, someone told me they occasionally close from time to time, so make sure they're open. So I went onto their Facebook page, and I saw from a few weeks earlier that they had announced that they would be closed that evening, and so there hadn't been any posts since, and I assumed, well, everything's going to be fine. Until I arrived at the restaurant, and there were no lights on inside, and there's, the parking lot hadn't been plowed, and I wondered if my Honda Civics was going to get stuck in the parking lot. We weren't going to be eating there because nobody was there except me, and so we had to find another restaurant. And I didn't know where else to go, and the, the friend I was going to dinner with, he, he didn't really have any options, so we just drove down the road, and the next place we saw with some lights on, we went to. And as we walked into the restaurant, the people sitting at the bar gave us the look like, you boys don't frequent this establishment. And we just kind of waved and nodded. And then we went and we found a seat. And I looked at the menu and there were a lot of different options on the menu. And our server came over and, and he was staring down at us, both because we were seated and also because the man was just a giant of a man. He appeared to be 6'11", 350. And he looked down at us. And he said, well, what are you boys having tonight? And I said, I don't know what's good. And he said, if it's on the menu, it's good, or else it wouldn't be on the menu. Which isn't really the best ringing endorsement in my mind. So I went with, all right, chicken takes up a whole page of the menu. So we'll go with chicken. And then I, I ordered the chicken dinner. They brought out the chicken dinner. The chicken was great. The coleslaw, which accompanied the chicken dinner, was horrible. The coleslaw was on the menu. I was going to inform the server that not everything on their menu was, in fact, fantastic because the coleslaw wasn't fit to be fed to an animal, let alone a human. But then I looked at him again and thought, I'm just going to keep this one to myself. <laughs> I'm not going to share that with him. See, the Lord is at work within me, all right? All right? God is working, all right? It's a process. It's a process. It's a process. And dinner ended up being, with the exception of the horrendous coleslaw, it, it ended up being really good. The chicken was great, and the rest of dinner, it was really, really good. This morning, we're going to look, as, as we continue our look at, at a letter that a former pastor named Paul wrote to a church in a town of Corinth, we're going to look at him as he answers a question that you're probably going to be scratching your, your head about a little bit. And, and he answers the question of what you should eat. What you should eat. Now, I know some of you right now are thinking one of two things. You're thinking, this has nothing to do with my life. Like, Brian, I've got, I've got real problems in my life. I have issues in my life. Why, why are we going to talk about what, what we should eat? And the other half of you find yourselves right now with an existential crisis because you're in a marriage like mine. And you love your, you love your wife or you lo love your husband very much. But every time you get ready to go out for a date and you decide to be nice and say, hey, babe, what, what do you want for dinner? Where do you want to go? You already know the answer you're going to get is I don't care. And you know that that is not true. That is not true at all. Because as soon as you turn into Burger King, you're going to find out that she does in fact care. She does in fact care. What she wants you to do, or what your husband wants you to do, ladies, is go through the 14 restaurant options that are available and list them one by one and hopefully convince you that it's the restaurant that you wanted to all along without just saying, I would like to go to X or Y. That is where I want to go to dinner. And so some of you right now are just freaking out because you're like, there's no answer to the question of what we should eat because I live this every time I go out on a date. And I just want to assure you, there is, and we're going to talk about it. And and it's actually going to apply to your life, I promise. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with us. And we're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to look at chapter 8 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it's a letter that an old pastor wrote to, to a church that he still loved and cared a lot about, and they had written him with some questions. And last week we saw that they had asked him about sex and about marriage, and so we talked about that. And now this week we're talking about food and why that matters. This is the next question as we start in 1 Corinthians 8. We read these words. Now concerning food offered to idols. Now let's just stop right there. Let's just stop right there. Now concerning food offered to idols. So understand that the, the environment where the church in Corinth was located was a polytheistic culture. 
It was a polytheistic culture. There were numerous gods. They were the Greek gods. They worshipped many different gods. And they also believed in evil spirits. They believed that evil spirits would attach themselves to animals. And the only way to make the meat clean from that animal was to sacrifice the animal to a god and thus make it clean for them to eat. So there was this crisis that people who followed Jesus were facing in their culture. And that is there were these celebrations and these huge ceremonies where people would sacrifice animals to the Greek gods, to false gods, and then they would eat it. And some of the people who followed Jesus thought, I shouldn't eat that because that animal is associated with a God who isn't real. And there were other people in that culture who felt differently. And then, so, so the first part of the verse says, now concerning food offered to idols, and then Paul says something really interesting when he says this, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Let's just forget the food equation for a minute. Let's just forget all about that. And let's just understand the essence of what he's saying right here. Spiritual maturity isn't measured in how much you know. Spiritual maturity is not measured in how much you know, but instead by what you do. And some of you are are like me, and you come from a background of really strong Bible teaching, and that's phenomenal. That's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. We should all strive to learn more about the Bible. But somewhere along the way, if we're not careful, what happens is we start to gain so much knowledge that knowledge becomes the end point, and we miss it entirely. We are consumed with knowing more. And and don't get me wrong, I've got a verse for just about everything that I can throw on. I, I love scripture. It's why I encourage you all the time to engage with it. But if we're not careful, what happens is we just become consumed with knowing more and knowing more and knowing more. And the principles of scripture never make their way from our head to our heart. And what God primarily is concerned about is our hearts. And when you look at the ministry of Jesus, the people that he had the toughest time with, the the people that he went after the most, the people that he criticized frequently were the people who knew the most about Scripture. And they knew the most about God. But some way, this disconnect happened where all of their knowledge made it into their heads, but it never impacted their life. And it never made its way to their hearts. God is primarily concerned Not with how much you know, but with what you do, with what you know. We all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You can know everything there is to know about God and about Scripture, about the Bible. You can know everything there is to know about theology. And if you don't have love in your life, if you don't care about other people, if you aren't concerned about the people around you, if you don't radiate love, it's pointless and it's meaningless. And it doesn't matter. Following Jesus is never about just gaining more knowledge. That's why you should never use an excuse as you've made the decision to follow Jesus. You should never use as an excuse that you're not ready to serve him because you don't know enough. Great, learn. There's opportunities to learn, but never use that as an excuse to say, I can't serve God or I can't be involved. I can't be invested because I just just don't have it all together. I just don't know enough. Because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And I bet, I bet we could all do this, that if we were to think in our minds, some of the people that we know who know the most about Scripture, some of the people that we know who know the most about Scripture, if we were to look at their lives, we would say they're the biggest jerks we know. They're the biggest jerks we know. Because this, there's this, this temptation That the more you know, the more authority that you have, and the more that you are speaking for God. I I guarantee you that if you know people who know a lot about Scripture, there is somebody that's coming to your mind right now that, yeah, they know all about it. 
And they can, they can repeat it back to you chapter and verse. And their knowledge you wouldn't question, but their life, there's a complete vacuum of love. I don't want to discourage you from engaging God's word. That's, that's not the point of this at all. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't know the Bible. No, don't get me wrong. But just make sure that the end, the end point is love. The end point is making sure that our lives look more like Jesus and not trying to make sure that everybody else's life looks like my life. Because that's the point. Love is the goal. That's the goal. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines, he continues, that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Love is the proof that you know God. Love is the proof that you know God. Not your ability to, be, to debate theologically, not the fact that you have a position on where you stand on every issue that divides people, not that you can have a chapter and verse quoted for everything. Love is the proof. Love is the proof. That you know God. And then he continues. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we exist. So here's what he says. Don't worry about whether the meat was sacrificed to something that isn't true. And we're going to talk about why this matters in just a minute and how this has implications in our life. Because I guarantee none of you have ever gone to the grocery store and wondered, oh, was there some ritual that the butcher had when they slaughtered the steak? I guarantee you, that's never come into your mind. All right? it's, it's just, it just hasn't. The closest I've ever gotten was around Christmas when I I picked up some steaks and somebody had put a sticker on the steaks and said, my name is Hannah. Are you going to be able to eat me? And I just looked at my wife and said, yep, "Yep, Hannah's going to be delicious. Like, it doesn't bother me. Like, that's fine. I I don't have that problem. If you're a vegan, don't hate me, all right? I'm not going to judge you for your soy lattes and chai seeds. That's fine. Like, we can just agree to disagree. And you don't ever have to eat dinner with me. That's fine. But, you know, you do you, I'll do me, enjoy your spinach. Uh, but, but I guarantee none of us have ever, ever been in the position where we're freaking out about our chicken or our steak or our fish and, and how that got into the market. But I'm going to tell you why this matters in just a minute. But let's, let's just think about this for a minute. So they're in a culture where there's a lot of gods. There's a lot of idols. And then he draws, he draws the contrast there from an age in which there are many things to be worshipped. There is ultimately one that is deserving of worship, and that is the one true God who was revealed himself to us in his son, Jesus. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And we live in a day and age, we live in a culture and a society that tells you, worship whatever you want. Worship whatever you want. And when we think about it, there are many things in our culture and in our society that are worshipped. For some people, it it is idols. For some people, it's pagan rituals. For, For some people, it's just other things that they elevate to a place that is greater than God in their life. And they don't even realize the fact that they have allowed those things, which oftentimes are really good things, on the surface, they don't realize that they've allowed those good things to become all-consuming things which drive them and now become their sole focus and their sole purpose and, in fact, creating their own idols which are bigger than God in their own life. Many things, many gods are worshipped. There is one God who is real, there is one God revealed to us in Jesus who is ultimately deserving of worship, and there is one God who should be worshipped above all. And it's easy to drive by and to look at statues and to say, well, that's, that's not real. But it's harder to look at our own lives and see what has taken the place of the preeminent position that God should serve in our lives. 
and to ask the question, have we allowed an idol to creep in and to take the place that should be rightfully consumed by God? And that's the question that's a lot harder to answer, but one that requires us to search our souls and to discover whether or not it's happening in our lives. And then he says this, however, not all possess this knowledge. Not everyone understands this, he says. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. And so here we get to this whole point about food and idols that makes sense in our culture and that each of us has to come to terms with. He says there are some people, because of their background, because of what God's delivered them from, because of where they were, that they really struggle with this concept. Because at one point in their lives, they did worship this. Because at one point in their lives, this was a struggle for them. And so here's this context that we can all relate to. That within those of us who follow Jesus, within the church, there are people who have different convictions on a number of different things. And that's perfectly okay. That doesn't make you wrong. Some of you may have grown up in a, in a circumstance or in a situation that you were told nobody should drink anything, nobody should gamble, nobody should see certain types of movies, and don't even think about going dancing because that is just the, that is just the entry point for Satan to take over their life, all right? Some of you grew up in an environment like that. Some of you grew up in environments obviously less strict than that, but you didn't even realize how much of those undertones were there. And the problem with all those forms of legalism is they start... They start from a place where you really want what's best for people. Legalism doesn't start from a place where you decide, I, wanna, I just want to subject everybody. Now, it can grow there very quickly. And that's why, again, we look and we see that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And the problem with legalism is it leaves that, that hopeful place really quickly of wanting everybody to have a great life. And it becomes rigid and it becomes the, the focus of your life has to look like my life because I know more than you. And this is the direction that you have to take. And so there have been a number of issues that the church has has, historically, not Lakeside in particular, but just the church collectively, has historically taken positions on and said, well, everybody needs to to look this way. And the reality is within the body of Christ, for those of us who follow Jesus, we don't. We can have different convictions on things. And that is the whole point that he's making. He's saying, for some people, they can't eat meat because of where they've been. Because of where God has taken them from, because of the flashbacks where they go back to their lives, where they were worshiping false things, and every time that they're faced with the option to eat meat, they go back and they think about the life in which they left, and it's a trigger for them. It really becomes hard for them to eat meat. He says, in in other people, they're like me. Other people are like me. You order the filet with a side of ribeye. Or, like, it doesn't bother you at all. It doesn't bother you one bit. Like The more meat on the plate, the better. And here's what he's saying. You're not wrong. For those of you who struggle, for those of you who, who think back to your past and it keeps coming back and you make the choice not to eat meat, you're not wrong. And for those of you who want nothing but meat on your plate, you're not wrong. And that's the problem historically that the church has run into. Because we haven't been quick to accept diversity. We've said that your life has to look like my life. And if your life doesn't look like my life, it means there must be something wrong with your life because there certainly isn't anything wrong with my life. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You can love Jesus just as much as I do and love nothing more than some oats and flaxseed. 
and you can love Jesus just as much as the person who loves oats and flaxseed, and you can order a steak, and you can both love Jesus, and neither one of you are doing anything wrong. Now, there are points where Scripture is crystal clear. And where Scripture is crystal clear, then we just need to abide by the standard of Scripture. But in places where it isn't, we need to defer that everybody has their own convictions. And we need to allow people to operate within their own convictions without judging them or thinking something's wrong with their life because they make choices that I wouldn't make. And then he continues. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? Listen, it's not about the food that you eat. It's not. That's why in two weeks, and we really encourage you to join us as we're going to have breakfast for everybody starting at 9 a.m. We know, we know losing an hour of sleep is never fun, and the kids are going to be insanely crabby, and, and it's just, it's just going to be a wonderful morning for all of us, and we'll put our fake smiles on after we've yelled all the way from home into the church parking lot and come in, tell everybody everything's going great, give each other a hug, and then just tell our kids, I better not see you for an hour, and if, if you don't have a different attitude when you come out of here, you're going straight to bed, and you're going to take a nap until 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. We understand, listen, we understand that Time Change Sunday is awful for everyone, this losing an hour is never fun, but we're going to make you breakfast, okay? So you're going to already be tired. You might as well be here. And for those of you who don't eat meat, we're going to have coffee cake. And for those of you who do, we're going to have bacon. And we're not going to apologize for it. And we're going to have a lot of bacon, a ton of it. Because when we look at the dietary laws of the Old Testament, bacon was nowhere to be found. So I'm not sure it's going to be in heaven. So I'm eating as much bacon on this side of eternity as I possibly can. Because I'm trusting that God has something better in store for me. But again, I'm still a work in progress. And so I'm still not entirely sure how he's going to outdo bacon. I'm sure he will. But in the meantime, I'm just going to eat bacon. So we're going to have bacon. And that's perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay because food will not commend us to God. We're no worse off if we don't eat it. We're no better off if we do. What's wrong for you may not be wrong for me. But in that, remember what we said to start. The knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so Paul uses this theme of food to tackle something even bigger than a debate whether or not you could have a steak. And he uses food to draw a parallel and to point out it's always about love. And just because something's right for you doesn't mean it should always be exercised. Just because something is right for you doesn't mean it should always be exercised. So as he discusses here, just because you don't have any convictions against eating meat doesn't mean you should go out with somebody who does and order a steak in front of them. You have the right to eat steak. But for somebody who struggles, love them more than filet. And if you've ever had a really good filet, you know how hard that is, okay? But he says, love them more than you love filet. Because they're more important. Knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. If you go out with a recovering alcoholic and you drink, don't drink in front of them because it brings back those memories. It brings back those, those things that fill their mind and that's, it's a struggle for them. And so is it wrong for you to drink? No. Is it wrong for you to drink in front of them? Yeah. 
Love is more important. Just because you have the right doesn't mean you need to exercise it all the time. Let love guide you. Let it rule your hearts. Not in, a, not in a way to bring about legalism. Not in a way that we can say, well, here are the rules that you have to follow. No, it's not about that. It's never about that. But what it is about is it's about saying, I care about you. I'm concerned about you. And so I'm willing to inconvenience myself for your betterment. I'm willing to forego things that I want to do for your good. And anybody who's been a parent understands what this is like. Because there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of options that you have that you don't necessarily want to do. No parent has ever in the history of its existence wanted to take a kid to Chuck E. Cheese. None. None. They may have thought they wanted to take a kid to Chuck E. Cheese. Five seconds into that cesspool of germs and meltdowns, they realized they never, ever wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese. And they would make a beeline for the exit. But they love their kid. So they're willing to endure the birthday parties and the singing rat that was come up when somebody was on shrooms. And they're willing, they're willing to endure, they're willing to endure all of that. All of that. Because they love their kids. And so it needs to be with us. That we just say, you know, this is what I do. But if I know that somebody has a problem with what I do, I will choose not to operate that way when I'm with this person. Be willing to forfeit your rights for the betterment of someone else. And then he closes out the chapter by saying these words, And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Be willing to sacrifice for the good of others. Be willing to sacrifice for the good of others. Understand that every single person has intrinsic value, that God cares about every single individual. And those of us who've made the choice to follow Jesus with our lives, we too need to care about every single person. Because we carry around the image of Jesus on our lives. And it's not about debates because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Which means there are going to be times that you could easily, easily destroy somebody with truth. But you choose instead to not respond and let love rule. So what do we do with all of this? Well, first, we have to be willing to sacrifice to help others. Be willing to sacrifice to help others. Is it fair? No. I'll tell you what my mom told me when I was three. Life isn't fair. Get used to it. I had a very loving mother. That's what, she, that's what she told me. She told me, life, life isn't fair. Get used to it. This isn't, this isn't fair. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to, my behavior shouldn't have to be impacted because of somebody else's weakness. But because I love Jesus, it should be. Is it fair? No. It's love. Be willing to sacrifice to help others. Two. 
Appreciate other people have different convictions than you. Appreciate that other people have different convictions than you. And it doesn't mean that you're right and they're wrong or they're right and you're wrong. It just means we're different. Other people have different convictions than you. Where Scripture is clear, our convictions need to clearly follow. But there are points and places where we have freedom. And our convictions can and will look different. And that's perfectly fine. So appreciate that fact. Talk about it. Dialogue. Learn from each other. Embrace it instead of running away. Instead of being ready to fight over everything, just embrace it. Talk about it. Discuss it. Have a dialogue. Appreciate other people of different convictions than you. Rather than build up walls and, and judge them. Third, understand the goal isn't to be offended by others' choices. We, our culture loves outrage. We love outrage. We love, to, we love to leave negative reviews. We love to cancel everything. We love to go about on social media and get people to rally around our causes. Our culture loves outrage. It, it just loves it. But understand the goal isn't to be offended by others. It's not, the goal isn't to be outraged by the choices that others make when they don't align with our choices. In fact, Scripture, scripture says that makes you weak, not strong. This is to protect, protect the person who is weak. The weak person is the one who chooses not to eat meat because of their past. That's, that's what Scripture says. So don't wear it like a badge of honor. But understand, the goal isn't to be offended. Love each other. Just love each other. That's the test for how well you follow Jesus. I really doubt when we stand before God one day, he's going to ask us if we're able to list all of the minor prophets in order. I just doubt it. Some of you right now are really hoping I'm right. You're like, what's a minor prophet, right? You're like, oh, I'm in, I'm in trouble. Some of you are going back to, to when you grew up and you had to memorize all 66 books in order and you're like, can I, can I still? I, I don't think the question that God's going to have for us is whether or not we can list all the minor prophets in order. And again, I'm a Bible guy. I love Scripture. I think it's, it's God's revealed Word to us. It's the heart of God on display for us. I'm not saying it's not important, just the opposite. But make sure that Scripture helps us love people more, not become legalistic. Loving each other is the test for how well we follow Jesus. And always remember, it isn't about what you know. It's about how well you love. And that's the point. And it's always been the point. Because God is love. He is the source. And our job as people who follow Jesus is to point that out to others and love everyone that we encounter. God, I pray that we would be people who love you well. I pray that we would be people who love each other well. Who care about each other. And are willing to sacrifice for one another. I pray, God, that we would increasingly become people who are devoted to you. That in a world that has so many other things that want to steal our focus and our attention. I pray, God, that we would just keep you at the center point of our lives. Help us love each other to the point we're willing to suffer for someone else. And help us see the beauty of becoming more like you in that process. Take our hearts, take our lives, use us, and make us more like you, Jesus, we pray in your name.